He had no remorse as well. I mean, I watched some of his, his uh, police interviews. Oh, and, don't you um, want to just punch him? Yeah, I know, right? <laughs> you, you kind of like respect to the uh, the officers interrogating him because he's got this irritating little laugh. Oh, that, so. <laughs> <laughs> it's not like being a scapegoat suddenly makes me untrustworthy. I was kind of untrustworthy before that. So. <laughs> and you just wanted to kind of reach out and... Uh, <laughs> right. Yeah. Yeah. And he just looked like a dick. <laughs> oh, he did. He did. And acted like one big yeah, time. Yeah, oh, he my was. God. He... Sue, welcome back. Good to have you. Thanks for having me, Van. Of course, of course. So. With regards to our last podcast, you mentioned that um, we, you were pretty clued up about Israel Keys. Yes. So I thought, well, let's talk about Israel Keys and um, pretty much dig into to that whole subject. Okay. So how did you get it? How did you get into, uh, you know, to be so familiar with him and what he did and that type of stuff? Well, I was teaching a serial killer class that focused on serial killers of New England. Okay. And even though Keyes lived in Alaska, uh, one of the murders he confessed to was a couple who lived in Vermont. Yeah. So he fell underneath my umbrella. Then when I started watching his interviews and really studying what he did, he was very, very cunning. Um, it got me even more interested in him. And uh, he was actually the scariest of all the serial killers I covered in that class because uh, just he's so cunning. Mm. He was, I mean, he, I think he idolized Ted Bundy. He did. If I'm not mistaken. And um, what made him so cunning was he would... You know, he wouldn't kill, he would kill in random places. So his areas, you know, the, the areas were usually remote, uh, you know, he, hiking trails. And he set up these, these murder kits, which, which we'll get to, get to a bit later. But so basically he was born in January 7th, 1978 in Richmond, Utah. And he was an American, for those that don't know who Israel Keys is, he was an American serial killer, bank robber, burglar, arsonist, kidnapper, <laughs> Sex offender. Uh, yeah, I mean, you narcissistic it, psychopath. Yeah, through he, and through. Yeah, and uh, he had the typical. Um, I think he was one of ten children, which is yeah. I think that's where the problem Crazy. started. Who has ten kids? I know. Why? why? <laughs> I don't know. I don't get it. <laughs> I really don't. <laughs> and. Um, I think he he grew up in a family i think they were mormons at first and then they converted to radical christianity um, oh i didn't realize the mormon part he, at first apparently oh. that's what i read yeah and then uh, they converted to radical christianity and also heard they lived in uh, a very remote area while while he was growing up they didn't have running water they really they were really like roughing it um for and yet keep kept having kids <laughs> yeah ten. <laughs> ten kids. God, it's crazy yeah and um his his childhood seems um <coughs> pretty hectic as well he then convert he then left his radical christianity faith and started and went completely the other side and started uh i think he started practicing satanism or something yeah and, yeah, yeah yeah and he also did the whole uh, as many serial killers do, the torturing of animals. Oh, of course. Yeah, and, yeah they got a, their practice. Yeah, yeah. I think yeah. there was a story of um, of a cat. Oh, with, yes, with the uh, neighborhood kids. Y yeah, yeah. Yeah. He strung them up in the woods and, uh, yeah, made all the neighborhood kids were horrified what he was doing to this cat out there. Yeah, I mean, well, it's, 
I wonder what part, I mean, if you grow up, you have no, I, th I think I read somewhere that they were living in tents for quite a while and you uh -huh. know, they had no electricity, no running water. They were homeschooled. So he didn't really have much of a, I would say a social upbringing, except with his nine siblings. other siblings. Yeah. Yeah. And I wonder if that, if that played a part in it as well. Yeah, I, I think he was definitely born that way, but I'm sure his environment made him act on his It's a strange impulse. environment, yeah. It, yeah, yeah. Because they're living like wild animals, really. Well, the, the thing is, when, you know, when I heard they well, went from Mormonism to radical Christianity, you know, there, there was a lot of anti-Semitic values attached to this uh mm. now whenever you go radically into something it's usually bad like yes. you know you know you become a you go radically into alcohol you become an alcoholic you know right. drugs whatever so if, you know moderation i would say is key yeah. <laughs> and, <laughs> absolutely but so yeah he had a and i read as well that he lived next to a guy called chevy I don't know if I'm pronouncing it right. Oh, and I... who was his neighbor or their okay. neighbor. And this guy was convicted of three murders in 1996. Oh, so, I, didn't, I missed that. Yeah. Um, huh. He was very, very intelligent, though. Well, his, his whole, the way <coughs> he went about it is is very interesting. And funny enough, it's, it's kind of, like you said, it's very cunning. He purchased a ticket to one part of the country in the US, one part, like one state, and then he yeah. would drive to like a thousand miles into another area where he would then commit his crime. So he, yeah. he was pretty much untraceable. He, he paid everything in cash and um, yeah. And he, ne and he never chose his victims in advance. Exactly. So he and had no history really... with the victims. So it, it was completely, I mean, it, I think he was a nightmare for, you know, for uh, law enforcement to oh, try yeah. and catch him. Yeah. He, he said he would unearth one of his kill kits that he buried and then choose the victim after. Yes. Yeah, so he did this mood. in advance as well. Yeah. 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 Just and the kill kits, of... for those that don't know, um, contained, I read, cash guns ammunition and zip ties uh, cable ties yeah, yeah. Uh, knives yeah well, you name it everything yeah. rope everything he would need it's a proper murder kit yeah yeah and matt just think about what that takes to just go all over the country burying these things knowing that one day you're going to use them but not now i mean that's that takes a lot it's definitely not impulsive no he wasn't an impulse killer he it, you know these things were so planned out and yeah which which is which is which is pretty scary crazy yeah the most he said like with the vermont couple after he undug the kit he just had a feeling like eh, maybe i'll do a couple and he just walked through the town and um, he liked the look of their house. So, yeah. I mean, for you and I, you can't protect yourself from that. That's well, the thing is, he, he picked the house because um, he had a whole way of doing things. So, he would pick a house um, depending, I think, on there had to be a, a garage area, yeah. I think. And uh, no kids because, according to him, kids complicate things and no pets because obviously you know dogs bark and alert people yep. and this was actually the one where i think this was on june 2nd 2011 where he flew to chicago rented a vehicle and drove a thousand miles to essex vermont where he killed this couple bill and lorraine courier yep and yeah it was a matter of seconds and he was in that house five to six he said yeah. from, from the minute the glass shattered yeah but he first took them to another location yes he he knew the area so well already for him to be able to do that yeah and um yeah <laughs> he he said he had planned that for months mm. down to every detail but 
his favorite part was tying them up. And he first uh, brought Bill, the husband, mm. down into the basement. And he said uh, he must have taken too long tying him up because by the time he came upstairs, Lorraine had broken the cable ties and was yeah. halfway to the street. And then when he finally killed Bill and had Lorraine, he spent like 30, 40 minutes just on the, the tying her up. Mm. He said that was his favorite part and he called it a thing of beauty. Yeah. He's, he's... yeah. <laughs> He had no remorse as well. I mean, I watched some of his his uh, police interviews. Oh, and, don't you um, want to just punch him? Yeah, I know, right? <laughs> you, you kind of like respect to the uh, the officers interrogating him because he's got this irritating little laugh. Oh, yeah, so. <laughs> <laughs> it's not like being a scapegoat suddenly makes me untrustworthy. I was kind of untrustworthy before that. So. <laughs> and you just wanted to kind of reach out and... and <laughs> right. Yeah. Yeah. And he just looked like a dick. <laughs> oh, he did. He did. And acted like one big yeah, time. Yeah, oh, he my was. God. He, yeah. And, um, well, I think the, the, he had a decorated military career as well with a bunch of, um, you know, he had an Army Achievement Medal, uh, Marksman Badge, Air Assault Badge. He was decorated. And yeah. uh, that's he, where he learned to kill. Yeah. Well, it certainly helped him. Yeah. Uh, I think infantry may, man badge. Uh, yeah, crazy. it could be why he got so disciplined in planning his murders because the, you know the military has a lot of discipline. So he might have yeah. learned that there, which just made him an even better killing machine. Yeah, he was. I mean, he he had a lot of patience as well. Yeah. Um, I read that while he was growing up, he would pride himself on going into the woods and just sitting there without moving a muscle for hours and hours upon end. And this was kind of like his his thing. I don't know. Yeah. Yeah. His type of meditation or whatever. Yeah. Just, yeah. yeah. Imagine. I mean, he... He, his body count really should have miss, uh, been way higher. Well, I th well, it, it, you know, yes and no. I suppose it wasn't as high because he was so patient. Oh, yeah. Oh, maybe. Yeah. yeah. He yeah. didn't kind of do a Bundy where he did like a bunch in one night and then, you know, the next day did more or, or you know, some of these other serial killers. Um, yeah. He was, he was just too patient and the thing is he wasn't impulsive so he right. would do a lot of traveling um and I, a lot of traveling i mean it's, yeah how did he afford that well he set up a, a company called keys construction a construction company in anchorage alaska which okay. was basically a front for his uh you know for his crimes huh. in a in a in a sense now how successful the company was i have no idea but it, i mean it costs money just to Go exactly these... yeah and he never really explains like where that money came from well oh. he was a bank robber as well oh right so yeah, yeah he could have had he did it all <laughs> that's true that's true <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> uh, until he got to samantha that was, i think that was the only impulse murder yeah, because it's, it was in the, it was in, uh, you know, the place that he lived. The kiosk, in. yes. Yeah. And, and he uh, brought her back to his his own shed at his house, and he said the whole time I was doing this, I kept saying this is a bad idea. You shouldn't be doing this here, but he just got, you know. Yeah, which with is it. which is kind of strange as well because it is. he he also kind of staked out that place because he knew that there were mostly younger uh like kind of kids working there yeah and he was caught on the cctv cam um coming saw in that. And yeah he was i think he ordered and he ordered a coffee and americano and then he told samantha to switch off the lights which she did and um samantha then 
I think told him that her dad was on his way and he was going to be there any minute and then he kind of hesitated but anyways yeah but he, he took her back to his shed yeah in Anchorage then he left her in the shed and went on a two-week cruise with his family to the Gulf of Mexico she was already dead though she was dead yeah she was in his, I think she was in his shed yeah. While he went yeah. on this cruise, yeah. Yeah, he had already raped and murdered her. and Yes. He may have even dismembered her. No. Before. no. Not so before he, the so cruise? Apparently, he came back from the cruise. Okay. Her body was then frozen. And oh. this is how sick this guy was. <laughs> he uh, then basically um, thawed out her body, performed sexual acts on her again. Oh, my God, with two weeks decomp. Then he dismembered her. Yeah. And um, got rid of her body in Matanuska Lake. Matanuska, okay. Matanuska Lake. Yes. Right. So I had Bobby Chacon, former FBI special agent Bobby Chacon on the podcast. And he was, he was, I think he was heading the dive team for the FBI. Wow. Um, on that lake. We know we're going to deploy a sonar first, a, a, which sits on a tripod on the bottom and does a circulating picture for us. And, um, yeah, they just started finding, you know, body parts in, you know, that was just dumped down there. And uh, it's, it, I mean, it was crazy. Earlier today, a forensic dive team discovered in Matanuska Lake what investigators believed to be the body of Samantha Koenig. Um, but I heard a, a strange story that he was apparently fishing with her body parts. And <laughs> when oh, yes. asked when and apparently the 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 during interrogation the officers asked him well did he catch anything and <laughs> i just wanted said, the same thing and he said of course he did and that well what did you do with the you know the fish and he's like well he took it home and he fed it to his family because he had a, i think he had a girlfriend and he's got a he he had a daughter who was yeah. i think 10 years old at the time yeah and according to his co-workers he was a very doting father um yes he always right. used to brag about his daughter and stuff and uh so it's very it's very strange and he just liked killing he didn't like have yes. a you know he didn't like bundy go after attractive women or something like that he just you know he just liked to kill he just kind of like he went by area yeah and then whoever came into that area that was fair game to him yeah so, and you notice how he words stuff um <clears throat> like he was telling the cat story he'd say the cat the house and then even when he's talking about the victims it was the girl yeah. or the husband or the they were like there's no there's no distinguishing human from a house yeah. or any any other object which yeah, I his, found that fascinating. Yeah, exactly. It's like his victimology was the area. Yeah. Instead of the actual, well, human or you know, victim. Yeah. Um, I also yeah, read, yeah. I'm, I'm not sure if this is true, but I heard that he, well, this was back in the day, he uh, apparently raped a girl as well. Uh, she, she was on a hiking trail, I think. And she kept on telling him, well, listen, you're a good looking guy. You don't need to do this. I'd probably go out with you regardless or whatever. And yeah. he left her. He kind of left her alive. And I think from then on, apparently it always bothered him that he didn't kill her kill because her. obviously he didn't cover his tracks. And I think then he kind of vowed never to leave anyone alive again, any of his victims. And I mean, he was interviewed by the FBI for I think like 40 hours. Yes. Um, yeah. For the Samantha, for the Samantha uh, Koenig uh, investigation, and he, I think he confessed to, he confessed to to murdering her and to seven more murders as well. Um, I think there was eleven total. Yeah, the, yeah, there was eleven total. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, but they and, think the number is way higher. Well, he 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 killed himself in uh, yeah. in Coward. prison. Yeah. And my first initial reaction was, uh, didn't wasn't he killed? Didn't someone kill him? But then I heard the there was a suicide note, and uh, they also found a drawing 
at the bottom of his bed of a pentagram and 11 skulls, which they think signify the victims, uh, the victims. Yeah. Okay. Along with the suicide notes, which they couldn't read because it was covered in blood. Um, but eventually the FBI, you know, kind of salvaged it to be readable. And it, it was just basically, um, you know, an ode to all his killings. So yeah. it wasn't really clues to anything because I mean, the, the bodies of bull and well, that couple, the carrier couple haven't been found to this day. Never. Right. Um, yes. And he loved that. He loved having those secrets. Yeah, well, he was playing a, a, a whole cat and mouse game with the, you know, with the um, officers that were interrogating him as well. How about when uh, they asked for the locations of other kill kits? Did oh, you... yeah. His answer was, if I tell you, how am I going to use them? I mean, <laughs> do you know where you're sitting right now? That's crazy. I, uh, I think he said there were kill kits still in Texas, and there were some in Washington, Wyoming, Arizona. I mean, yeah, yeah who every, knows? Who knows how many there are? Yeah. Just to focus back on the Samantha Coney case, the one part that kind of is really, really like insane and just disturbing is when the <laughs> ransom photograph where he took a, a photograph of samantha and he actually this was after she was dead he put makeup on her and took fishing line and sewed her eyes open and put a newspaper next to her so it, it looks like she's alive wow and then he got asked and then he asked for a ransom of thirty thousand dollars to be paid into her bank account i do remember this yeah yeah and i mean geez and then um he would i think he would he was only allowed to draw 400 or 500 dollars at a time yeah and he managed to get quite a lot out as i understand it yeah. uh, from the thirty thousand dollars and um he always wore a disguise when he was because obviously the atms have cameras and stuff but that is how he got caught because they they saw the car he was driving in the vehicle yeah that always gets you yeah yeah, yeah i think they found he was driving a white rental car and they obviously alerted the bank to send the police an alert whenever he drew money yeah because i mean there's there's like a, a two to three minutes um time frame when the police will get that alert i mean by then he's driven off already right and luckily he was i think he was caught in lufkin texas yeah yeah he was, and yeah. um when the police officer asked for his license he you know it's an alaskan license and um he was then extradited back to to alaska from texas we're, we're investigating okay why is that kidnapping where? I don't know where you're from. Yeah. He didn't want the town of Anchorage to know anything about this because obviously these were his people. His, you know, he's got a little goal there. Um, and um, while they were digging, well, while they were doing the underwater, you know, to try and retrieve the body parts, there was obviously a lot of tents and stuff around with the fbi put up and you know all the people of anchorage were like okay well something's going on yeah and because yeah. she was still assumed missing at that point yeah well, no one knew that she was dead and um yeah then they just kept on bringing these body parts up and yeah it was it, it was hectic and he was he was angry about that because they made kind of like a spectacle about the whole thing. They didn't keep it that private. I feel like, you know, I told you from the get-go, before I even told you where the freaking bodies were left, I told you that I didn't want the locals involved. The first thing you do is make a big scene, do a big freaking archaeological dig right alongside the main road. That poor girl, when she was walking to the car, I can't even imagine. Mm. Yeah, that was... That was, and I mean, the, you know, her whole family, her whole family is still, you know, with the ransom note and the picture of her where it looks like she's alive and, you know, her, he even braided her hair. 
And he said he braided her hair the same way that he you know, used to so braid his, his daughter. No, he used to braid his daughter's hair. So, um, wow. Yeah. And a, a lot of his siblings didn't go to his, uh, his funeral, I believe. His mother, four sisters, and their husbands attended. Key's six other siblings and former Colville neighbors never made it. Do you blame them? <laughs> Plus, they probably have uh, problems like him on top of it. Well, you know, the topic of nature versus nurture always comes up. Yeah. Um, the, the the way he grew up... Now, I don't know, I don't know, you know... If, if, don't know if he was abused as a child or but it, it wasn't it wasn't kind of like a normal upbringing right um, yeah and like, those radical religious groups exactly. often abuse their kids well it, yeah again anything radical um never turns out that well right um, <laughs> right <laughs> so, so, true. so it was yeah he was yeah, he was, um, surprisingly, he isn't that well documented for some reason. No, most of my information came from his um, interviews. Oh, I do have that I wanted to share because this was very interesting. Um, a forensic psychologist commented on the case I'll read you what he wrote. Uh, it, it's fascinating. Oh, he said he's known since he was 14 that there was, that what he thought was normal, nobody else thinks was normal. I think this probably started with the, the cat. Yeah. Now, well, let me try to find that. Uh, okay. I, yeah. So he had said, you talk about uh, closure and things like that because the police obviously want closure for yeah. the family mm. and he says but I don't see it from that point of view it's done is done I'm just saying I know you have pressure on you to find these people but frankly they'll keep I don't feel the same moral obligation that you do and the forensic psychologist said basically what he's saying is we're operating on two different principles here you're operating on the principle that how people feel matters. He's saying, I'm not that kind of animal. And it's very true. He doesn't have the wherewithal to, for empathy or to even view people as human. Well, the thing is, you kind of wonder why did he commit suicide? Was it because he was ashamed of what he did and he couldn't live live with it. i don't think that's the case i think he, that was kind of like his final f you i was just gonna uh, say that yeah because this was like before his court case yes yeah and he said i'll tell you everything but i'm i don't want to stick around for the aftermath did he say that yeah so he said i'm gonna give you bits, bits and pieces now but uh i'll give you the rest later mm. So apparently his end game was always suicide, which really doesn't fit someone with such a huge ego. Usually, you know, like uh, Epstein there. Yeah, Epstein didn't kill himself. Although, I mean, nah. let's, not, let's not get started on Epstein. <laughs> but I think, I think uh, he's kind of falls into that same category. So uh, Epstein didn't, but this guy did. I don't know, you know what, I don't know. The, the thing is, he was, you know, having that, that, that radical upbringing, and it is a radical upbringing. I mean, everything oh, yeah. about his childhood is radical. Ten, you know, you know, nine siblings, nine. I mean, that is, yeah. And, um, you know, the whole radical Christianity thing, they were living in tents, apparently, yeah. in one stage. And um, I wonder if his, you know, his ego being what it was, he kind of wanted to be different in a sense because i mean he had no life he was going to be in prison for the rest of his life yeah That's done for sure i wonder if 
his ego on the flip side like i hear what you're saying like you yeah. know fc wouldn't kill himself because of his ego and i i, I agree with that yeah. i wonder if he didn't he didn't go way past that and kind of that was his final you know screw yeah. you to the police and to all yeah. the victims and whatever you'll never get closure on anything because his suicide note was basically in a sense i believe bragging about his the victims that he killed so there was very no well more... could be yeah but i mean that's obviously up for speculation the one thing i just want to know is because he he slit his wrist and he strangled himself <laughs> by tying himself but how did he yeah. get a blade in there that's that's I, what i want to know they said so i think he used a disposable razor yeah how does, how does he get that now even well, I think you, I think you can have a disp disposable, but how do you slice your wrist with a disposable razor? I mean, unless he like ripped it apart. But yeah, I would... kind of. Yeah. Was it a disposable razor? I think so. Yeah. Okay. So you'd have to rip the guard off, right? And then do those come out? I don't. I don't know. Well, he just essentially he just had to shop and he just needed something sharp. Um, yeah. And uh, yeah, they found him in, you know, face down in in blood. So, and that was it. And that was yeah, that was just it. Kind of fit like with the rest of his his life too. In all the interviews, you know, he he'd give them a piece here, a piece there, and then say, "Nah, you're gonna have to wait." Or Give me a cigar and I might tell you another story. Oh, so annoying. Yeah, he was, he <laughs> really was playing the, the whole, the whole cat and mouse game. I, I mean, he, he knew he had leverage on anything. I think he being from military background as well, he was kind of, and he was kind of like a student, I believe, because he was idolizing Ted Bundy and, you know, he, he kind of knew how the whole system worked in a sense. So yeah, he studied Bundy. Mm. He, he researched him in depth. Yeah, he was his idol. Which was crazy because Bundy really wasn't um, that methodical. I mean, if he killed two decades later, he would have been caught like right away. I mean, Bundy told the people on that lake or beach or whatever that his name was Ted. Yeah. I mean... And he was so, I mean, his final killings were so impulsive. I think it was like, you know, in those dorm rooms. He just, oh, went, yeah. Yeah. He went in, yeah, crazy. He just went into a frenzy. But, um, Sue, thank you very much for your time. Appreciate oh, it. Oh, my pleasure. <laughs>